Hello, Mr. Angier here. I hope you are safe and well. Welcome to week three, uh, climate change. What is the evidence for climate change? This is a copy of the week three work. So um, essentially we're answering this question, what is the evidence for climate change? And if you want any additional help, then the textbook pages are there, they're on your Teams class. And of course, please have a look at this, uh, this PowerPoint as well, which is obviously what you are doing. So um, moving on, in order to do a good um, job answering one of these four tasks, remembering that it gets more difficult the further towards the right you go, we need to be able to do this. So we need to be able, first of all, to describe some of the evidence. All right? That's really important, describing what the evidence looks like. So how do fossils, how does uh, the shape of the land, how does that sort of thing um, actually tell us that the climate has shifted? Now, the next step on is to be able to explain how this evidence actually helps us to know the climate is changing. So why does the shape of the land indicate that there might have been a, a change in the climate in the past? What can fossils tell us? What can ice cores tell us? And how do they actually tell us these things? And some of you might go on to apply this information to researching a real world example of uh, the evidence like a glacier. Maybe you, you go off and you find out how a glacier has changed over the last few years. That would be a really good example. So first thing that I want to show you is the graph to show annual global temperature changes between 1880 and 2013. And this is really important because there's an awful lot of debate around climate change um, and what's causing it and who's responsible, etc., etc. But one thing that isn't particularly difficult to do is just to measure the actual climate and measure the temperature averages every year. And it's pretty clear, isn't it, that this graph's doing two things. Now, the first thing that I would always look at is a line of best fit. So um, a line of best fit essentially would look a little bit like that. And it's clear, isn't it, that the line is going in an upward direction. So the average temperature um, has, uh, has increased over the last, uh, over sort of 120 years, so it's something like that. The other thing that the climate is doing, or the temperature I should say, is it's going up and down. It's doing this rapid up and down movement. And that rapid that up and down movement is referred to as fluctuations. Um, fluctuating means going up and down. And of course, that's one of the things that makes this a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, sometimes the climate seems to drop, it seems to get, uh, get a bit cooler. Sometimes it gets warmer, but measuring over a very long distance means that you can avoid looking at anomalies. Imagine that you were just looking at um, this period of time here. Well, that would suggest that the climate was actually, um, or the temperature, sorry, is getting um, a, bit, uh, a bit colder. But actually, if we look over a longer period of time, we can see that the opposite is happening. So there's lots of different things that we can look at in order to identify whether the climate is changing. And some of these are here. We can measure ocean heat. We can measure the sea level. We can, me we can measure sea surface temperature and the amount of sea ice. Um, we can look at the temperature over the ocean. Humidity, that's a good one. Air temperature near the surface and the troposphere, that just refers to um, the, the uh, sort of like lowermost area of the atmosphere. We can look at the size of glaciers. Some of you will go and do that in uh, a few minutes time and snow cover as well. And we can also look down here at temperature over the land. So there's lots of different ways in which we can simply measure what is happening and whether there is going, whether there is a change over time. But what's the actual evidence? Okay, so yes, we can make our measurements. That is evidence in itself. But there is also some evidence to suggest that the climate has always been changing. So if we look at this one over here, this is a fossil. And when you're looking at fossils, what's really useful is to look at what type of adaptations that fossil has. Um, and that can that can, or what we can do with that then, is identify what similar adaptations um, animals that live in, in certain climates have today. So, for example, 
um, there's definitely some um, suggestion that this country, the United Kingdom, used to be much, much cooler because we have found fossils of animals which are adapted to cooler conditions. We've also found the opposite. We've also found some fossils of animals which seem to be adapted to warmer conditions. So they're really, really useful. And the second one over here uh, works in exactly the same way. We can identify through plants as well what type of adaptations they have. Are they adapted to a warm environment or are they adapted to a cooler environment? So this one is obviously um, a, a tree. And what you tend to find is that in cooler conditions, cooler climates, you have these pine trees or these evergreen trees, Christmas trees essentially. Uh, now Christmas trees are very good at living in colder conditions. Their pine cones, sorry, their pine needles, um, make it pretty difficult for snow to stick to them. So snow um, falls off really quickly. They don't lose their leaves because it doesn't really get, get warm enough even in the summer for them to photosynthesis just once a year in the, in the summer. Uh, they are um, they are constantly requiring that to, to get whatever uh, sunlight they can get. So yeah, if there was lots of fossils of uh, evergreen trees, then um, it would suggest that perhaps the UK might have been a little bit cooler. Now, this one here on the right hand side, I put number three in the bottom uh, right hand corner, uh, you can see here, can't you, that there's a massive valley um, and um, there seems to be quite a small river now, I want you to think, is this small river, is that really likely to have created all of this erosion? And of course it's not. Now, what we tend to find is that in a river's upper course, where this is, where the river big, where starts, where the river starts, it's quite small, and this is quite small, it's not really very powerful, and it can really only erode downwards. And what that does is it creates a sort of V-shaped valley like this. Right, that's what we would expect. But this clearly isn't a V-shaped valley. This is a U-shaped valley. It's got very steep sides and then a very flat valley bottom and then very steep sides again. So what has previously happened is a glacier has been in this location here. And a glacier has eroded all of this area. The glaciers erode a little bit in the same way as rivers do. They abrade. Um, they also do some, some other things. They do things like plucking. So um, um, the glaciers will move over rocks and they will melt around rocks and then they will freeze again. And as the glacier moves, it pulls those rocks out of the side of the valley. The glaciers are essentially uh, very slow moving rivers of ice. So they do move, albeit very slowly. And then finally, down here, we've got an ice core. Now, ice cores are really uh, useful. They're, they're useful for a couple of things. And this picture here is great because you can actually see some of the, um, the bubbles, the air bubbles, which have been trapped uh, in this ice core. Now, if you don't know what an ice core is, I suggest that you look at the video on the next slide because that's really, really useful. Um, Actually, sorry, it's two slides in front. Um, but um, essentially, <clears throat> ice cores are, are, are drilling down um, into the ice. You tend to find this sort of thing happening in the Arctic and Antarctic, sort of the Antarctic, probably, um, and <clears throat> drilling, um, drilling in. And, and what that does is that allows scientists to analyse what the climate was like. So when they pull ice cores up, which look like this. What they're looking for is these air bubbles. Now, these air bubbles give scientists a real indication of how much greenhouse gas was in the atmosphere at the time. And of course, we know now after the last couple of weeks work that greenhouse gas, there's a lot of it. The temperature on the earth is going to be averaging a warmer, a more average a warmer temperature and uh, if there's less greenhouse gas then we're going to see cooler temperatures. So um, the other thing that ice cores do is they work a little bit like tree rings. Now you can see a tree ring, you see how much um, uh, growth that tree has had if you were to cut a tree down and you were to identify whether there was a big gap between rings and that would indicate lots of growth or a small gap between the rings and that would indicate a small amount of growth. And 
These ice cores work in exactly the same way. Where there's a big gap, that would suggest that there's been lots of snowfall um, and it's been quite wet and cold. And where there is less of a, uh, a gap, a smaller gap, that would indicate perhaps it's been a little bit drier. So that's a really important point as well. Um, but of course, again, even in this uh, example, there's still lots of small uh, bubbles that scientists uh, can suck the air out and they can identify um, what sort of concentration of greenhouse gas we've been looking at in the atmosphere. And just to make the point, this is what I was saying, um, if you want to pause the PowerPoint and click on this link, I would um, recommend it. This is a really good video to help you identify um, what an ice core is and, and what the people um, who are working on these ice cores are actually doing and where they're doing it. Um, and just to make the point about um, greenhouse gases, uh, the top line here is the, the red line. That is carbon dioxide levels in parts per million. So that's uh, helping us identify how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. And you can see in the bottom, uh, the bottom one is the blue temperature. You can see that there's a, a big correlation, isn't there? When carbon dioxide levels go up, so does temperature levels. And um, this therefore helps scientists identify if they if they find that there's a large concentration of uh, carbon dioxide in these small little air bubbles then that would really suggest that the temperature was going to have increased all those many thousands or even millions of years ago Now the other thing that we can do at the moment, um, and in particular over the last few years uh, since the 1970s, is think carefully about uh, the ice in the world around us. Now um, there's a couple of uh, examples that we've got um, down in the uh, sheet below. We've got September 1984, and we can, this is an example of sea ice up in the Arctic. And you can see in 1984, uh, it's, it's pretty big, there's quite a lot of sea ice there um, and in the same was well, it's one day earlier actually but the same month September 2012 it was September um, 1984 there September 2012 we've got a much much smaller um, amount of sea ice uh, in the the Arctic there and that should be a really um, significant visual cue to help you identify that perhaps um, the, the climate is indeed changing. Now, just as a, a side note, I asked you as a challenge a couple of weeks ago to think about some of the benefits that climate change might bring. And of course, um, we, we tend to get very worried, don't we, about climate change because we are not adapted, our, our ecosystems are not adapted, our plants, our animals are not adapted to a rapidly changing environment. But I think it's also important to remember that in some cases there might be some benefits and this area here um, is a sea lane which previously you couldn't get through uh, because there's a little bit of ice if you look over here in um, 1984 this sea lane was blocked by ice but in actual fact this sea lane it, this is the north of Russia uh, this is Russia here um, this sea lane um, will actually cut down the journey time between East Asia and Europe but quite significantly and um, that, that's potentially a bit of an opportunity for Russia and countries in Europe and Asia who want to trade with each other. So it's always good to try and look at both sides of the argument and that doesn't matter what part of geography um, you're looking at, it's always good to identify positives and negatives um, on, on any, anything that you're looking at and then come to your own conclusion. So um, that's an introduction to the evidence of climate change. Now, remember, you need to choose one of these tasks to do and submit it to your class teacher. Remember that the ones towards the right are a little bit more tricky than the ones towards the left. So choose something that's appropriate to you. I hope you enjoy doing this week's work. And if there are any questions, please give me a shout. Thank you very much and stay safe.